All right. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. I want to also start to thank the organizers for bringing us together here after what's been for me more than two years of um, seeing you. So it's great to hang out in person, catch up with you in, in, in the breaks, and I really appreciate that. The work I wanted to talk about is, as Thomas said, catalog modelized faces, geodesics, and flops. So it's a very classical topic in string geometry, and I thought it fits nicely into this workshop. It's work done in collaboration with uh, the Oxford physics crew here. Well, Callum is now a uh, Virginia Tech, but the other two collaborators are in Oxford. So here's the outline of my talk. I will be covering these three papers, which appeared within the course of the last year or so. And I've picked uh, several topics from them, and I hope you will find at least one of them interesting. I will start with a short introduction about the types of um, calico and walls you can have. And um, these are the so-called primitive contractions. Then I will explain to you how to um, deal with the geometries of Calviaus that are related by flops. And then I will specify um, to the case of Calviaus with Picaring 2, so h from 1 equals 2, and look at the geodesics and a classification of these manifolds um, completely in general. Um, and the last part of my talk will be about applications of um, this flop story, the Kavamata Morrison coin conjecture and mirror symmetry before I conclude. Good. So let's start with the um, type of calicone walls. So the calicone is just the cone of califorms, um, which essentially means that all volumes are uh, positive. So if the volume of the Calabiao the volume of divisors and the volume of curves, they have all to be non-negative. And this means that if you reach the wall of a calicoan, some of these become zero. The um, simplest case is just a flop wall. So you collapse the curve. Collapse this curve here to a point, but the divisor here or the Calabiao itself um, stays finite. Then um, you could have a divisor collapse, and this divisor could collapse either to a curve or it could collapse to a point. Um, we call this the risky walls, which is a misnomer, I have to admit. Um, perhaps we should have used the, um, the nomenclature that was set out by the Cox and Cuts or whatever for these primitive contractions, but we already had a lot of cases and types, so we call it um, the risky wall. This is because it comes from so sort of in, in the case of surfaces, these types of walls correspond to uh, the risky decomposition. And then finally, you could have the uh, entire Calabiao collapse to, well, in this case, it collapses to a divisor. So these are the different types of ways your calicone can end. And then, of course, in the case of flops, you can glue a second calicone to it, and you get what's uh, called the extended calicone. So the cone of effective devices. Good. So let's um, talk about the flops. So of course, you're probably all familiar with the uh, standard example of a flop in toric geometry, where you just sort of have some triangulation and you flip it. But there are uh, several other possibilities that can occur. So for example, you can flop a curve in Yamin space that also leads to a flop of, flop of the curve in Kabiao. This is this. Um, so it's the standard way of, of getting flops on the Calabiao. But you can also flop curves in Yamin space that miss the Calabiao. Or you could flop a curve on the Calabiao that's actually not a curve in Yamin space. Or you could even do more exotic things like flop a curve on the Calabiao that's then flopped outside the geometry into the Yamin space. So these are collector flops. I don't have anything to say about these. They're very um, fun things, but I, I will focus on, on these types of effects. So let's look at the Calabiaus related by flops. So in fact, um, these are very easy to, gen uh, to generate or to just write down. And you already ha get them in products of projective Emian spaces. So in the most naive picture, this might be a little bit surprising because projective Emian spaces have a unique triangulation. So you precisely do not get into the case where the flop is induced by an Emian space flop. These are all the cases where the flop is only essentially on the Calabiao. And um, whenever you have a product of projective spaces, um, Pn times some other P, 
And um, this, these are sort of the, uh, the degrees of the equations that you write down that define the complete intersection, each column. And if one of the columns looks like this, you, so you have a PN with just n plus one ones here, and then whatever below there, you can flop along this PN direction. Or if you have a two followed by a bunch of ones and zeros, where the number of ones could be zero and the number of zeros could be zero, you can also always flop. In general, this type one flops here. They lead to, a, after a flop, they lead to a new color VR. In the special case where all these cues here are the same, they lead to an isomorphic color VR. So you actually do the geometric transition, you get a new color VR, but it's isomorphic to the old one. If the, all these cues are the same, here there's no restriction on the piece, this always actually flops to an isomorphic color VR. Um, one thing to note is that after you do this flop, typically you're leaving the realm of having, um, of just having simple, um, simple complete intersections and projective ambient spaces. Typically you get something more complicated. And we will see an example for this. Here it is. So you can start with this um, very simple color VR. So you have um, a P1 times P4 ambient space and you have two equations, one of degree one in the P1 coordinates and three in the P2, sorry, in the P4, and one of degrees one and two. So that's, a, that's of type one, it has this one one here, the Q's below are different, so you will flop to a non-isomorphic color VR. You can write down the um, two equations that come with it, so it's linear in, in X1 and X2 here, and it's cubic in the P4 coordinates, and the second equation is also linear in the P1, coordinates and it's quadratic in the P4 coordinates. So I can write this down and I can write this set of equations essentially as this matrix, F times X equals zero. X's are project um, ambient space coordinates so they cannot vanish simultaneously. So what this means is that the determinant of this matrix has to be zero. So essentially you can just um, slow down this MP1, you get a singular thing which is given by the determinantal variety and you can transpose this matrix so exchange along here, get a new matrix, you can resolve it, and this is now described in terms of this uh, toric model, so you've gone essentially from this uh, more simple complete intersection to this more complicated toric complete intersection via determinant variety. Uh, an example for the second case where you have flops on the ambient space that do not li um, lift to flops in the color VR is uh, is this a very simple Kreuzer-Skarke model? So if you look at the effective cones, or the cone of, sorry, at the effective Kähler cone or extended Kähler cone, you would find essentially that it's bounded by these two lines. And the model allows for flop transition al along here, and it allows, it has a risky wall uh, down here. So naively you would say, okay, so I have these two different color VRs, one lives in the blue region, one lives in the uh, yellow region, but if you actually calculate the color VRs here and there, you would find that they are the same, so they, this flop is actually just a flop in the ambient space. The color VR doesn't even notice it. Um, so if you're just naively counting triangulations, you're over counting. So if you try to infer how many, how many color VRs you have from just counting the triangulations of the ambient space, you would be over counting in this case. Of course, you would also be under counting other possibilities like these that come from flops that you actually don't see in the ambient space. So it's just a statement that you have to be careful. So the color VR doesn't see this wall at all. So a third thing that can happen is that actually these different walls can turn into one another by complex structure tuning. So you can turn a flop wall into a Zariski wall, um, which essentially means that your space is not locally a product of the KL and the complex structure moduli, and I will have a little bit more to say about this later. But, so if he, here's an example what, what you can do. You can, again, start with this very simple projective variety. You can write down the hypersurface equation, which is sort of degree two in the axis, so you have an x naught squared, x naught, x1, x1 squared, and then a polynomial of degree four in the P3 coordinates, and now I just do a complex structure tuning 
where I set all the complex structures in here to zero, such that I'm left with this one. And what is happening then is that you get a previously non-effective device, or this one here, actually become effective. Um, and this then precisely leads to a wall uh, that changes the previously possible flop. So this was of type two, so you actually had the possibility to do a flop into a uh, into the Sariski chamber. And this also means that so these Sariski these Sariski chambers here are very interesting or maybe very boring depending on your taste uh, basis of sections of the devices. So they are actually just constant. So you would find the same along these diagonals. You just find the same um, H naughts over and over again. Whereas, of course, when you flop to an isomorphic color BR, you would just find um, the same sections. So if, if you flop, let's say th this is constant and you're flopping from here to there, then you would find um, the, the sections of the line bundles that are in here reflected into the sections down here. So by doing this um, type of decomposition or by getting this extra divisor, the, um, the number of sections precisely change in a very interesting way such that they become constant along the lines. Good, so these are types of examples that can and do happen um, quite often and already in very simple examples. Good, so yes, in general you can have these um, different setups. Um, so you can have a calico in essentially it looks like this, it has a risky wall, ending it on the one side, you can flop to let's say a non-isomorphic color BR and then the calico and ends, ends outside of here. Um, you can have a setup for example, um, this one without tuning, where you flop to an isomorphic color BR on the other side, and as I just said, so if you, you fix this line, so you're flopping here, so if you fix this, and this calicone boundary gets mapped onto that calicone boundary. So you're doing this flop. So now let's uh, think about what would happen in a situation where I have um, sort of this setup where this gets flopped here, but I can also keep this one fixed and flop this one here down there. So now I, I'm in a situation where I can essentially map this here and this down there. And now, of course, I can repeat. So once I have flipped, I flop this up here. I could flop along this direction and map then the green line here. I can repeat this flop, map the blue one here and the green one again, so I get an infinite set of flop chains. The walls of my uh, effective cone, my, I mean my effective cone is still a cone, so I still get these walls, but within these walls, I get infinitely many flops. Um, so in fact, we can actually write down these matrices M that, that do these reflections quite easily for the two different cases we had. So we have um, this case where we just have a bunch of ones and then all the same Qs down here, or a two followed by ones and zeros with some Ps. And depending on the case that you have that leads to, uh, to these flops, you can just write down these matrices M in terms of the charges that define the uh, complete intersection. And these numbers that appear here in this matrix, so let's so if you car rank two, you just have a single M here. They are related to the um, triple intersection numbers and to the Kobakuma buffer invariance via these equations. Essentially because you're shrinking curves in the flop, this is, um, this is how, this, uh, how the BPS invariants enter here. So on the one hand, you can just read it off from the GSM matrix, and then on the other hand, you could also, if you know, the if you know that in these, you can just calculate what this M is. So essentially one, one simple way of actually finding these, for example, in H1 equals two, is to just see when this product, sorry, this, this quantity here is an integer. Good, so the group that's generated by these M1s and M2s is actually um, an interesting group. So let's briefly look at it. So we have these matrices M1 and M2, and they are reflections, so they um, square to one. 
So the group has um, this final, uh, sorry, has this presentation. So it's, you can think of it as a direct, pro uh, sorry, as a free product of uh, Z2 and Z2. And if you now, let's say, define M1 to be generator S, and M1 times M2 to be the generator T, this S is Z2, this T is of infinite order, so you can think of this group as being Z times same direct product Z2. And you can write any word in this group just as T to the N times S to the M, where T is an integer, sorry, where N is an integer, and M is either zero or one. So you cannot, so I couldn't put a second M2 here because they would just cancel. And also note that T inverse is just M2 times in M1. So if N is equal to minus one, I'm just sort of instead of M1, M2, I'm getting M2, M1. And also um, conjugating by S um, is the same as taking the inverse. So S T to the minus N, S is equal to TN. So that's, that's a group that's generated by these reflections. It's essentially a triangle group um, two to infinity in, in the Picard rank two case. Um, and we can calculate um, what these elements t to the n look like in generality. The details are not important. You can write these in terms of power series and some four common symbols here. But um, the point is it's completely explicit. And now you can calculate if you had the so if you had the calicone, and then you had the limiting slopes here and here, you can calculate sort of after doing infinitely many flops, which, what is the boundary of the effective cone wall? And this just means you take this TN, you send N goes to infinity, and you look at, for example, where, where one zero is mapped if you do this infinitely many times. So you send n goes to plus infinity, or you send n goes to minus infinity. And what you then find, sort of one zero would be mapped to a n c n. So the slope of this line is just um, c n over a n in the limit n goes to infinity. And funnily enough, the quotient of, of this expression with uh, this expression here is, uh, is just some finite thing you can essentially use the binom binomial theorem to resum these things, take the limit, and what you find is, uh, is an expression of this form. And similarly, for this wall, you can do the same thing and you find the same expression with uh, the rows of M1 and M2 inverted. So if you look at this, um, something weird seems to be happening if M1 times M2 is smaller than or equal to four. So in fact, if uh, let's first start with the normal case in some sense, m1 times m2 is larger than four, then you can show that this expression is always irrational. So you have a bunch of um, calicones, each, of one, each one of them is, has a rational slope, but the limiting boundary of the extended calicone has a uh, irrational boundary, so there is no divisor on the final, on the final wall of the um, calicone. If M1 and M2 is equal to four, this is the only case actually where this is, this is rational because the, the root is just a zero. And if M1 times M2 is smaller than four, this M3 product is actually not infinite, but it's a finite order. And depending on what the different cases, what M2 and M1 can be, you just get, um, just get these direct products of groups. Um, I should say that this case is pathological in the sense that the calico and wouldn't be a cone. Rather, what would be happening is you would be, you would be not asymptoting to some effective cone walls here, but you would, with the reflections, you would essentially fill out this entire space. So the cone, effective cone wouldn't be a cone. This is not possible. So these cases actually can never, these cases actually can never occur here. And since these M's were related to um, intersection numbers or BPS invariants, you know that Calabiaus uh, with certain intersection numbers cannot exist. And this is, of course, also what was pointed out by Thomas uh, in, in the context of the limiting mixed Todd structures. Good. So um, these are, this can happen if you have infinitely many flops, you get this group. 
you get um, the boundaries of the uh, of the effect of the extended Kähler Cohen. You can calculate this, and um, usually they are irrational. So the, at the end of the Kähler Cohen of the extended Kähler Cohen, you don't have a divisor that. Um, so the question was whether I can see the field theory um, statement. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Um, I would have to think about it. Thank you for the question. Good. So um, this is a complete general story. So now we wanted to restrict to um, Calviaus with Picaring 2 and uh, look at the geodesics in this case. And in fact, for any Calviaus, irrespective of how it's constructed, you can calculate the geodesics. Um, so I want to focus on compactification of M3 to 5D n equals 1 on Calviaus threefolds. The reason I want to do this is at this point of the talk, I want to neglect um, actually BPS. Uh, instanton contributions, so I want to be able to just go through the wall and um, trust my metric and uh, my corrections there. I will talk later about cases where, where, you get the, uh, where you get the corrections, but for now I want to focus on this. So what this means is you get uh, what's called very special geometry, which means the Keller moduli live in the vector multiplet moduli space, except for the overall volume, which lives in the complex structure moduli space, in the hypermultiplet moduli space. So you can essentially take the Keller parameters as um, coordinates on your Keller moduli space, except for the overall volume, which you need to mod out. And we're calling the, the, we are calling the parameters with the overall volume modded out bi. So what this means is that you get this constraint that the overall volume is fixed, essentially. But the um, geodesic equation essentially looks, looks as always b double dot plus um, the Christopher symbol of the Keller, cohen keller metric times bi, uh, bj dot bk dot is equal to zero. So that's the geodesic equation. And we can solve it in principle for any color BL, but for the Picaring 2 case, we can actually do better. Because as it turns out there, you can identify normal forms for the, um, essentially this just comes out of uh, the theory of having essentially this asymmetric cubic um, potential in terms of the triple intersection numbers into variables. And then you can always write a polynomial, which is cubic, into variables um, in one of these four forms. Either you can just write it x cubed, you can write it as x cubed plus y cubed, x squared y, or x, y, x squared y plus y squared x. You can then um, calculate the metric on the Keller modulized space. The details are not so important. You can just work it out completely in general. And so the, which of these normal forms you can map to is dictated purely in terms of the triple intersection numbers. So what you need to do is you need to calculate the rank of um, this matrix. So this is a two by three matrix. This has rank at most two. And you need to find the number of distinct zeros when you think of um, X and Y, the two Keller parameters, as uh, coordinates on an RP1. So this has either one, two, or three zeros because it's a cubic form. Um, this has either rank 0, 1, or 2. And then depending on what the class and the rank is, you know which, which normal form you can map into. And by just constructing the map, you can then sort of solve the geodesic equation in these four cases, and then map your color BIAO onto these geodesics, and you have reconstructed the geodesic for the color BIAO you're interested in. Um, so this first case here is actually pathological again. It's, it's sort of the calicone is empty. So this metric is, of course, it's, uh, it's never full rank. In the other three cases, um, you do get consistent metrics within these gray shaded regions here. So in case one, it's this region. In case two, it's this or this region. In case um, three, it's one of these three regions. So what you can see here is that if you now plot the geodesics, or if you plot the curves of constant volume here, you see that um, all of these cases except for here 
essentially you have an infinite distance point here, here, here. So at this wall, the, um, at any of these walls, the volume of the KVR would go to zero. You're forced to be on a constant volume. So you only reach this essentially at infinite distance. This point here is different. At this point, you sort of reach a calico and a, a wall in a finite distance, and these are precisely the Zariski chambers when, when this happens. So now the question just becomes when you, when you have your Calabiao and you map the calico of your Calabiao into one of these normal forms, sort of if you, if under the map you hit, you hit this wall here, you know you will have a Zariski chamber. If the second thing is mapped here or so, you have a second finite point and then you can flop. Or if, uh, if the second wall is actually mapped here, then you have an effective cone wall. So you really just need to construct the, the map from, from your original manifold onto one of these cases. You see where the boundaries map and you know what, what type of things you reach in finite or infinite distance. And just because I find it amusing, here are the solutions to the, uh, yeah, the, the solutions to the uh, um, geodesics equations. So one is just a singe and a cosh. For case one, essentially the reason that you get a singe and a cosh is the trigonometric identity between cos squared minus sin squared, because one essentially puts you on the constant volume. In this case, it's just um, exponentials, and in this case, it's every trigonometric function on the planet. Um, Again, sort of due to trigonometric identities, this enforces again the uh, the constant volume condition. So looking at these, it's actually also kind of remarkable that you can change, let's say, from from a Zariski wall to a flop wall, or vice versa, because essentially you could be changing changing these uh, geodesics into that geodesics, or you could go from let's say if you're um, if your walls map like this, you can sort of take this part of the geodesic and then you can sort of get a new color BR with this color cone, so you can connect it to this geodesic and so on. So you can actually um, glue all these uh, solutions together along the extended color cone. Good, so th these are the solutions. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, good. So these are the, um, the solutions for the rank two case in the, um, in, in the 5D case where we just get the corrections from the flops. And in fact, these corrections have been understood by Witten and what he showed is essentially when you reach a flop wall, all that happens by the corrections is they change the triple intersection numbers such that if you cross the flop wall and you get into the new color Biao, your intersection numbers are the intersection numbers of the new color Biao. So these the risky walls here are still a little bit strange. When you um, hit this wall, essentially you have to be in that case here. And if you look at the derivative, or if you were just to, let me actually clear this. So if you, um, if you approach this wall here, along the geodesic, what you would find is essentially that you're that the derivative along the curve blows up, so you would actually go along this curve, you would accelerate, accelerate, you would crash into this wall here at the service key point, and then you would be spit out in the opposite direction again. That's, of course, unphysical, and so what is happening is what's also argued by witness that you actually get an additional SU2 along this wall. So you get an additional SU2, this additional SU2 is a gives, introduces a vector multiplet, you need to take this properly into account in the vector multiplet modelized space, and this actually then cures this pathology. Or we expect it cures the pathology. We actually didn't, didn't do the calculation. Okay, so this brings me to the last part of my talk, applications of, um, of what I just told you. So the first one is um, application to the form and distance conjecture. So let's consider the case where you have infinitely many flops. So for example, you are sitting on a point here, 
this point is equivalent to a point here, is equivalent to a point here, is equivalent to a point here, and so on. So you can just sort of do these infinitely many flops, and you go from one equivalent point to the next. Um, we can, for example, use the solutions we just had to calculate the geodesic distance from here to there, and typically it's a few Planck units. So if you have infinitely many flops, I can go from one point to a completely equivalent point while traversing an arbitrary long distance along a geodesic. So if this was the shortest geodesic, essentially this would mean that you're sitting at, you have two completely equivalent color BLs with exactly the same spectrum that are separated by a geodesic of arbitrary long length. So this would um, actually mean that the from the distance conjecture is false. Of course, it's not false. Well, I don't know whether it's false, but it's not false due to this reason. Um, uh, because essentially you should also ask what, what's the fate of this group G? I mean, there's another Sondland conjecture that says, of course, any global gauge theory is either broken. I mean, any global theory is either gauged or broken. It's not broken in this case, the, the symmetry group G, but so is it gauged? And the answer is yes, it is gauged. It's a remnant of the 11D diffeomorphisms which we had before we compactified. So this means in your theory, you need to divide it out. Essentially, you should only be looking at this one color cone, not at all the isomorphic ones. And the shortest geodesic from here to there would be the shortest geodesic from here to here, so from the point itself, so it's geodesic length zero, and of course everything is, uh, is consistent here. You could, of course, still, I mean, this would still be a geodesic motion going back and forth, but it's not the shortest geodesic, so it's not interesting. Good, so um, essentially the no global symmetry to conjecture together with the, uh, works beautifully in this case, this is from the distance conjecture and both of them uh, are fine. But then you can ask the question, what if these, all these infinitely many Calabiaus were actually not isomorphic? So can I have a setup with infinitely many Calabiaus, each of them different from the other? And this is essentially the um, statement of the kavamata morrison cohen conjecture, which says that um, the extended Keller cohen always only has a finite number of uh, isomorphism classes. So you actually cannot, if the kavamata morrison conjecture is true, you cannot have infinitely many non-isomorphic Calabiaus in the extended Keller cohen. Um, so this means, in this case, again, um, there, there is no problem. And you might even um, try to turn this around and say, okay, so if there are infinitely many Calabiaus, so I have this picture here, now let's assume they are all different. I can go from so sitting somewhere comfortably in the middle of the um, moduli space to somewhere else sitting comfortably in the middle of the moduli space along some geodesic, which can get arbitrarily long because I have arbitrarily many isomorphism classes, and I'm assuming that, they, that the geodesic distance that it takes to traverse any one of them is not getting um, it's not getting extremely small, extremely quickly, so I can be essentially away from the walls. Then this would mean that just sitting here at this point, I would think I'm in a perfectly fine uh, quantum gravity, so sort of I, I, I can take the supergravity approximation and I'm sitting here, everything should be good. Likewise, if I'm sitting at this point, there's nothing very special. I'm just sitting in the middle of the modelized space, I'm away from all the walls, should be a good supergravity as well. Nevertheless, so there's, there's this um, geodesic that connects these two. This can get arbitrarily long. So this should mean that with respect to this point, let's say, at that point, a tau of states should have come, come down by the geodesic distance. And if I can sort of make this geodesic distance arbitrarily long, a tau should come down arbitrarily light. And this still happens while I'm sitting somewhere where I would have thought my supergravity is a perfectly well-defined supergravity theory. So now it just becomes a plausibility argument of whether you actually want to, want to buy that I can have this arbitrarily light states after traveling an arbitrarily long distance, or whether you would then like to put a bound or cut off at how many 
how many different isomorphism classes you can actually have in your color BL because at some point it just sounds ridiculous to walk an extremely long distance um, and still get two perfectly fine looking um, two perfectly fine looking supergravity theories. So this actually essentially then becomes also a question of the gap between the first massive KK mode or uh, questions like this. Yeah, so the sort of to recap, to cover Martha Morrison Cohen conjecture says you cannot have infinitely many, so you cannot have arbitrary light states, and conversely, if you say sort of these two supergravities should be should be fine and well defined, then you cannot um, you can also not have infinitely uh, infinitely many if you believe the if you believe the uh, swarm the distance conjecture. Good. So let me very briefly also talk about other applications. So. Um, one thing I want to highlight is that this classification we did here was also looked at for completely different reasons. People looked at H11 equals two manifolds uh, in this paper, and they essentially classified them into different cases, into one which they call the strong Swiss cheese, one that they called case refibered, and one they called hard cases. And um, this matches one to one onto our classification, essentially because the strong Swiss cheese has a diagonal del pezzo. Having a diagonal del pezzo means that essentially d dotted into anything and d squared dotted in into anything is a zero and only d cubed is non-zero. So you get um, this structure here. Having a K3 vibration or well, vibration by abelian surface, but they are K3 in our case, by Ogrizo means that you have a divisor that dots uh, so the d is um, not equal to zero, d squared is not equal to zero, but sorry, d is not equal to zero, but d squared and d cubed is equal to zero. So we only get this um, linear term in y. We have the K3 vibrations. And then these other cases, which are, well, they could be elliptic vibrations, or they could be just standard color BLs without a vibration structure. And of course, we can also um, then um, use the techniques of the limiting mixed hot structure of the dual to then assign these um, to either type one, which are at finite distance, as we saw the uh, Zariski walls are at finite distance and these Zariski walls appear in here, or type two, which are K3 vibrations, or type three and type three, uh, type four, which are the more, uh, more general color BLs in this case. So this is m sort of yeah, m matching onto the classification here and on the, uh, onto the limiting mix Todd structure of the dual, which was of course um, pushed by Thomas and his collaborators into our um, community and into our understanding. And finally, it's interesting to ask actually what's happening, what the implications are of this, of this infinite group for the, uh, for the mirror dual. And for this, I now want to come back to um, essentially writing down the, the corrected um, metric here. So you get, in general, you get this um, classical part of the loop term, and then you get these instanton corrections here, which are some poly logarithm and the uh, Gopakuma Bata invariants here. And if you now have this infinite group that maps one curve to another curve, what this means is that the uh, GV invariants of, of these two different curves actually have to be the same because they are just mapped onto another by a group. This group G is of infinite order. So you're mapping infinitely many GV invariants onto one another. So actually, instead of summing over all these degrees of the curves here, you can break this down into group orbits where you sort of just have one and then all the, all the images of this one curve under, uh, under this group G. And as it turns out in, in special cases, so for example, if the, the two integers M1 and M2 that appear in this um, matrices are just two, so their product is four. In that case, I can go to these Pockhammer symbols and they actually resum into something very nicely. They resum into a theta series. So in this case, I actually find uh, that the holomorphic genus zero pre-potential here is a theta function. Um, interestingly, the case where this happens, or one of the cases where this happens, is the mirror dual of, a, of what's called the uh, hulik verrill manifold, and this was studied recently in two contexts. Um, one was by Albrecht Klemm on banana loop diagrams, and the other one was by Philip Candelas and collaborators uh, 
where they so show that this manifold has a rank two attractor points, which then has very interesting consequences for number theory. And the Hodge conjectures, the right conjectures tell you that these things actually split over specific points in complex mu structure moduli space. They factorize. Um, so it's interesting that this precisely happens for one of these cases where we have these infinitely many flops in the most symmetric case, or rather a, a quotient of that. But um, that's all work in progress at the moment, and I hope I can report more on this in the next meeting in 2023. But it's, uh, it's this interesting relation, and I should say that um, the Cornell group also found this um, type of theta function appear for uh, Euclidean D3 brains in the 4D uh, theory, and maybe uh, Jacob will talk more about this uh, in his talk later today. Yeah, he will, okay. Yeah, I, I have my co conclusions, but uh, I can just, <laughs> I, can, I can leave them here. Um, you can read them, and I'm happy to take questions. We are good in the time. Uh, any questions? Yeah, um, if you look at the, I mean, this X and the Y, this is, this is this blue curve here. So now if you look at what happens once you re actually reach the wall, you would find that essentially due to the, so this arc, this S here is the curve parameter that appears in here. Since this sine is, sinh is squared, if S sort of comes positive and goes negative again, the sinh and the cosh squared here just stay what they were. So the, the, this means that essentially your geodesic motion would look like um, you follow along this curve, you hit this risky wall at s equals zero, and then you spit out again and you go back. So this, from this perspective, it just looks like you're bouncing off to the risky wall. So, this by, itself, I mean, this by itself wouldn't be a pathology, but if you now look at how this happens, you take essentially the derivatives here, you get a one over sinh, and then you actually find that the sinh of zero is zero. So you find that you actually crash into this wall at infinite speed, and that's a pathology. And this actually does not happen because at this wall, this is, so this is one of the cases where when you actually hit this wall, um, an extra, vector multiplet becomes light. So the vector moduli space that, well, we actually, we use this 5D n equals one theory because we wanted to protect ourselves from contributions or rather to understand the contributions to just sort of the flop walls changing the triple intersection numbers. But if you reach these are risky walls, your, um, your description still breaks down because you get this extra contribution to your vector, multi mod vector multiplet moduli space. Uh, sorry? I couldn't understand. No, no, um, you just get, yeah, in this case, it corrects the wonderly space metric and it prevents this from happening. We didn't try to work out what exactly happens if you include this extra vector multiplet as you approach the wall. Sorry? It corrects the, it corrects the moduli space metric because you get an additional vector multiplet. So the, uh, these b's that we have here are, um, are the coordinates on the vector multiplet moduli space, and we assume that we just have h11 minus one many of them because we scaled out the overall volume. So now when you reach this, you get additional ones from the SU2 that we don't take into account here. No, uh, it's, it's a very good... 
Yes, thank you very much for the comments. So Sakura's comment was that, of course, and um, once you reach these and you include the, the, the light vector multiplets that you get from the gauge theory, you can actually um, study these theories. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing, which we haven't done so far. So far, we just looked at the standard geometric flops that you get um, without take. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We we haven't um, accounted for these. So we we only took the case where we didn't have any additional vector multiplets. Uh, you don't need infinitely many flops. So this is true when you have a flop to an isomorphic color B L in this case. Um, and it just sort of, it's ju just telling you essentially that the number of curves that you shrink are related to, um, I mean, yeah, once you reach the flop wall, you know which PN, I mean, which curve shrinks. And then um, you know about the number of curves in this class essentially will tell you when you, so when you do the flop, there's a pre prescribed way of how the triple intersection numbers change, how the uh, second churn class change and so on. And from these changes, you can just reconstruct sort of what this M has to be in terms of the triple intersection numbers. You don't get any CCs. Um, I only checked it for CCs, but um, I, th I think it's the, I think the statement should be general. Okay. Don't quote me on this, but uh, yeah, so uh, it really, it just comes from the fact that you know how the triple intersection numbers and the second churn classes change uh, through a flop. This is for h one equals to two. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the the, the fact that the uh, triple intersection numbers and the churn class has to change is, is independent of. Uh, so you know how these things change um, through a flop, independent of. Yeah, you can just yeah, you can just reconstruct it because you know they have to be isomorphic. So you know, you, so by Wall's theorem, you can you can construct the matrices that map it onto one to another. And yeah. thank you.